Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Saturday Morning D&D Show. My name is Jordan, with a silent PH in the middle, and I am joined always by my wonderful co-host, Sir Lucian, over at Sir Lucian Gaming. Say hello this wonderful morning. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a Saturday morning show. As I warned Jordan, I am dog-sitting a third mm. dog, so it might be a little barky. If you hear me go quiet, it is because I'm hitting my mute button for your ears and your ears only. But keep that volume <laughs> close. But I couldn't miss the best Dungeon and Dragon show on the internet, so I had to be here. <laughs> here, here. Speaking of muting yourself, <clears throat> I've got quite the cough. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, we're a Dungeons and Dragons podcast show thing, streaming live every Saturday at 9 a.m. Pacific on Twitch and YouTube. You can catch us and chat with us, and it's lots of fun. Um, we love to, to see you guys. And I noticed that we had some new uh, iTunes podcast reviews, so I wanted to say thank you guys for reviewing the podcast and, and, and putting those out there. That's really awesome. Um, it just helps us get the show out there, which is the, the whole point. We think we have a fun show, and we want other people to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so... We talk a little bit about D and D news, and then our our home games. Sadly, I am in like full rehearsal mode for the play that I'm in, so I did not get a lot of games in. Um, but we did finish my BX game, and I did not talk about my Salt Marsh game last week because last week we just kind of talked about Eberron forever. So mm -hmm. um, we can talk a little bit about that. Um, but what what's in the news, Mister Lucian? Well, it seemed kind of slow after we got the avalanche from last week, and we probably don't need to re-delve into too much of Eberron. I didn't see too many more things come up. No. Uh, oh, the only tweet I did see, I guess that second little blip there in our notes, was I saw a tweet that may have said that the Artificer is going to have the Artillerist, the Alchemist, and maybe the Battlesmith. So it sounds like maybe it was the Archivist that might get the cut. So they're not going to release the four that they tested out, but um, See, and uh, be, there was. But that could be wrong. That was no, just no. And I, that's what I want to happen because the archivist, although an interesting concept, didn't. It was the least likely one that you could take and put into another fantasy setting. The yeah. archivist felt very much like it's either Eberron or nothing because you've got like holograms and and you've got a, a a pet, but it's like a pet hologram that can't be damaged and it interfaces with technology and things like that. It just didn't. Like, it works really well for Eberron, but part of the charm of this class, I think, is porting it over to your games and, and using it in that way. Um, but I thought they did a, uh, a a poll or something and that the Alchemist was the least favorite one. Um, but that's my favorite. So I was like, oh, don't get rid of the Alchemist. That sounds like no fun at all. Mm -hmm. um, and then they turned around and they're doing this now. So, but... I don't know. To me, it made the most. But yeah, it made like, the most obvious choice to get rid of the archivist. Archivist, maybe that's mm -hmm. how you pronounce it. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Have you been playing the thing, uh, the artificer at all, or do you have any in your games? Or yeah, I got that one up to about level eight or so in an actual campaign. I theory crafted a few higher level ones, but that was as far as it went. And then I kind of sat back to say, okay, let's see what they're going to do with the actual release. Because usually on the release, it won't be exactly the same as what the UA article had. A lot of times those classes have minor tweaks in the wording that could really change the class. And I bet that they do that with this one. So. I'm waiting to see what the official is, and we won't have to wait too long because it should be in the, the Eberron books. So. Yeah, it should be November, right? So Yeah. Well, which is so crazy. And far. then, yeah, uh, uh, Descent into Avernus is coming out September. So September is literally tomorrow. Fall mm -hmm. is here. We're going to have all kinds of, like, pumpkin spice lattes and, and leaves. <laughs> it's just going to be wonderful. Um, it's my favorite time of year. My birthday's in the fall. I love it all around. So I'm mm -hmm. excited for tomorrow. Um, and then on a side note, I was telling Lucian, uh, you know, it's fall where I live because of the hot air balloons. So there's a balloon festival where I live and I'm going to go crew a hot air balloon tomorrow and cross my fingers. Maybe I'll be able to go up and take some photos. Um, uh, and that would be in video and stuff. Cause it's just really fun and beautiful to get that high up in the air. And it's so you silent need to get on the dungeons and dragons, hot air balloon. Yeah. And if they don't have one of those, they need to make mm -hmm. one. <laughs> giant ampersand balloon yeah. that takes you up or a giant dragon or you know a giant gelatinous cube could be oh cool. Ill yes i was about to say it should be an illithid head with all Illithid's the tentacles but like a gelatinous cube that's even better 
um, you could you could tape uh, mannequins to it or something that's all getting ingested. That would be really fun. Yeah, yeah. So other than that, I think a lot of people, a lot of the community are probably split up between doing Dragon Con and PAX West. Mm-hmm. I think Dragon Con is on the East Coast. I'm thinking PAX West is the Seattle one these days, which used to be called PAX Prime, right? I think. Yeah, they- I think they changed it because they were like, well, it's like the PAX East is actually bigger than PAX West, I think, just because the convention center is bigger. Yeah, um, okay. So yeah. at this point, it was kind of like, oh, well, why call it Prime when it's, I mean, it was mm-hmm. the original, I guess, but then they have PAX South and, and PAX Australia and there's yeah. just PAX everything now. So. PAX everywhere now. Yeah. We need, yeah, there'll be a PAX like Central uh, United States, PAX. <laughs> yeah, which I which I really, maybe I'll try to go to PAX next year. Um, this year, uh, a friend of mine was trying to get a panel going on D&D lore at PAX West and wanted to know if I was going to be there so that I could be on the panel. And I'm like, that sounds awesome, but I'm in this play. So I really just couldn't juggle the the dates very well. But um, I liked, I, I, I live close enough that it's it's within driving distance. Like I could go to PAX. It would be a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have friends in Seattle that I could stay with and stuff. So I don't know, maybe mm-hmm. next year I'll try to make the, uh, the, the, cause there's still a pretty large board gaming scene at all of these. It just, not just PAX Unplugged in, uh, Pennsylvania. Is that yeah, where that is? Philadelphia. Yeah. Philadelphia. Um, it's not, uh, just PAX Unplugged that has the, the board game stuff like regular packs does a lot of board games and rpg stuff as well so it could be fun and i could catch an acquisitions incorporated live show which would be a lot of fun they so. had one last night so i'm waiting to see um hopefully that gets posted at some point maybe it's already out there and i hadn't found it yet but that'd be something i look at over the do they the archive holiday. the the vods to watch them on they twitch do. okay so yeah, i yeah, mean yeah. it'll it'll take a week or so for it to get to youtube it usually does but you could watch yeah. it on twitch i guess yeah, it should be good because it should be the continuation from, I believe, the PAX Unplugged game, mm-hmm. which was the last where we left off our adventures in Ravnica and mm-hmm. they were escaping a giant kind of worm. Not any spoilers there if you haven't seen it already. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, hopefully maybe it'll come out early. Sometimes it's out early, but like you said, sometimes it takes a week before it gets out there. So we'll see where jeremy crawford takes the crew because jeremy crawford's taken over for chris perkins which has been really cool and he's got a really fun and cool way to dm his own different way um and i enjoy it quite a bit listening to him explain things and i love the voices he uses he really kind of grew on me now that they've got him in front of the camera doing dungeon master stuff Mm -hmm. a little bit more than just you know we know him as you know answering rules on twitter or maybe doing some of the q and a's and some talking about UA articles and stuff, but it's cool to see him doing the, the real dungeon master work, which is Yeah. Cool. No, he's really good. Um, but I got to say that I miss, I do miss Chris Perkins. Like I just, there's a special place in my heart for Chris Perkins and he's not DMing any games now because of dice camera action and things like that. And so it's just kind of like, Oh, we're just, we're just not getting enough, enough Perkins in our life. And yeah. it always reminds me of, uh, when I, when I, at an old job, I used to work at testing video games. Um, we would have these like weird conversations and one of the weird conversations is like, well, who's your imaginary uncle? Like you can always like pick a celebrity that you want to be that like your uncle, you don't see them all the time, but when they show up, they're really fun and they're, they're doing, you know, and you just want this like fun, awesome uncle, this celebrity uncle. And I was like, I want Chris Perkins to be my celebrity uncle. <laughs> and I was thinking about that a couple days ago. I'm like, he's just such a neat guy. So yeah, that's a good one. I'd have to pick something like, a comedian like jack black maybe oh yeah somebody super funny <laughs> bruce campbell was always a popular one bruce Un- uncle bruce guy. yeah yeah he's a michigan guy too yes. yeah there you go um <laughs> yeah his book, if you haven't read his book it's really no good. it's really good yeah i totally I'm, I'm a big fan of bruce campbell and seen most of his movies yeah. um yeah so we have new, oh go ahead no go back to artificer for just a little bit like we have yeah. the alchemist in my game he's level four now they're gonna be level five pretty soon um, and yeah, they're like dumping temporary hit points on stuff. And I just, I don't know, like, I, I really like the artificer. I'm, I'm excited to be able to buy this source book and then use it in other games, I guess, because like I was saying earlier, aside from the archivist, it felt like 
like you could kind of pluck this into other campaign settings fairly easy by just being like, well, he's the kooky mad wizard that learned how to create a ray of frost using his like repulsor hand gloves or something like that. And so, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, that was about it. But (laughs) which version of the alchemist? Because there's been two UA article versions of the alchemist, right? We're using the latest uh... one. Okay, so, so you're using, he's using the the humunculus is yeah, that really yeah. crazy word to say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got yeah, his humunculus. How does that work out in the campaign? It works out pretty good. Um, it died the last time we were playing. Um, there was uh, well, I'll get into this when we talk about our games, but there was a big attack, and and I was like, oh, so, and I asked him, I'm like, I can attack this, right? And he's like, yeah, it's got hit points, it's got armor, like it's just a thing on the battlefield, and I'm like, okay, well, if it's the one causing all of this temporary hit points and stuff like that, I think my my monster is going to go after that just to stop that from happening, and um, he did, and uh, I guess it reforms after a long rest, and there's not a lot of repercussions for losing your pet. Unlike the Beastmaster Ranger, where you kind of have to go out and find a new animal. But if you were, like, if you were on the high seas or something, you can't really go find a jungle to find a new pet animal. And they really liked the Beastmaster Ranger update they made that they never, they never published, I guess, officially. <laughs> Where yeah, the yeah. animal was more like a spectral animal that you could like prey and this this animal would like reform as like a fey spirit or something so that you always had your beast companion rather than yeah. having to go out into the jungle. Like the Beastmaster Ranger is really awesome and we don't need to get into a huge pros and cons of both classes or anything. But mm-hmm. uh, it's so specific to certain campaigns like if you're doing a if you're doing water deep the beastmaster ranger probably doesn't work very well but if you're doing tomb of annihilation you're constantly in the jungles and you can find new animals and stuff and that could be really good but yeah my my hack to that was always i would think that the the ranger should get like a level one spell that is resurrect companion yeah and it's only good for that it can be used at any time and it doesn't matter if there's a body left over or not it doesn't none of that matters the ranger should the beast master ranger should always be able to get their their pet not just a different one either because Mm -hmm. that's like asking let's take your wife for just a second who has the really cool corgi dog please take my wife hi loves (laughs) i am sure she is not going to be in a campaign decide okay well that's gone now let me go find a cool wolf or a cool tiger no no no. there's an emotional connection to very much so there is not just i'll just go get a different one yeah Um, no very much so there has to be a mechanic that says that brings them back you know for sure and Yeah, and we hacked it that uh, after a short rest, no matter what your pet's hit points, your sorry, your pet's hit points restore to full on a short rest. And mm-hmm. if it ever gets like incapacitated, it just takes a long rest to 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 bring back your pet. So you're just yeah. out out for the battle, basically, kind yeah. of. A thing. It, it's a Hollywood animal. <laughs> it yeah. never dies. It but never no, goes- that she's and she's made it very clear that she's like, <laughs> you can kill my character before you kill that yeah. corgi pet. And I'm like, okay. Yep, and that's the way it should be. <laughs> so that's pretty good. So that's cool. I didn't get to play the Alchemist too much. I know we had one in our campaign, but it was the first edition of the Alchemist. And that one was more of a, a potion throwing yeah. kind of class um, where it was mixing stuff up in the bag and doing stuff and i think that's similar but definitely they changed it a little bit um with the latest version of it so it was interesting but that's cool uh, other than that not too much i mean we've got our upcoming release dates that we've all talked about over and over and over you can check those out in any one of the other shows it, probably in the last five shows we've talked about all of the different dates that have come up and we'll say them again as they get there we're like a week out from Avernus at this point, I think. No, it's two weeks out. I no, think. 17th. So 17th. Yeah. Okay. 17th. Um, something's coming out pretty quick. Really? I pre ordered my my uh, Descent into Avernus and I pre ordered the dice set that comes with like the big map. Did and you get the box? The cool yeah. little box set? Yeah, that yeah. did look good. Uh, yeah. Totally worth it. Like, I mean, I was just like, this is the coolest thing. I've, like, it's because I've never bought the dice before that come to with an adventure because I'm always like, ah, I mean, that's cool. But like this one was very much like you you get not only a really cool set of dice, but like the map and it comes in the cool box. And so I'm like, I could put it on my shelf and it just looks cool. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> and I'm slowly trying. I keep thinking I'm going to use I don't know if I'm going to run all of Avernus, but I want to use um I want to use uh, at least the 
the hell parts for my Shadowfell game. And so um, when they escape the Shadowfell, maybe I can convince them to go to hell through something. Some I got to figure that out. Which, uh, yeah, so I, I got to figure out um, my my uh, Shadowfell game because I have all of these, like, well, I want them to go here and I want them to go here, but how do I dangle the carrot enough there? Or how do I get them into a bargain where they have to kind of a thing? Um, mm-hmm. Lots of lots of figuring out with that game, but I'm having a lot of fun with it. So That's cool. So that's about it for news. The only other thing I thought, not necessarily Dungeons and Dragons related, but it definitely was a pretty popular thing happened earlier this week, which was World of Warcraft Classic hit. And the only reason I bring it up, because I think during that time in 2000s, that early 2000s throughout that, it was a time when Dungeons and Dragons was maybe on the down slide at that point, and and everybody was moving away from, or not everybody, but I think a large majority of people were looking for their RPG fix, their role-playing game fix, and they found it online in this digital world that got released to us in 2004, and then we, many of us sunk many, many hours into it, and now they've just released Classic, and it looked like yeah. Twitch, it was it was like one of the highest Twitch watch shows. It's still, I checked it yesterday, and it was still listed as number one as people watching players play it and going back to this old-style game, and I thought it was interesting that people were willing to go back to an older game. We're talking a game that is, you know, 15 years old at this point, retrofitted back to the way it was and it had all of its um, things. And we were talking a little bit about why people would want to go back to something that's older or why people would want to go back to something that was harder than it is to do now. And I thought the one thing that made sense to me, it would be if you kind of compared a little bit like <clears throat> Dungeons and Dragons, three thir- third edition basically and then you have dungeons and dragons fifth edition where things are are definitely more streamlined but it would not surprise me if wizards of the coast said hey we're going to do a dungeons and dragons classic which is basically a reprinting of the third edition rules maybe added in with some of the the 3.5 things they added to fix the early what was going wrong with 30 so you get a real official 3.5 re-release as a nostalgia thing as a hey we've we went through and did all the formatting of it to make it run a little bit better and it all looks cooler in the books we've got really good artwork that matches back in that time i bet there's still big groups of people that'd be willing to jump right back into that because once you've done something that's nostalgic and once you have that connection to something that you loved it doesn't matter that 3.05 is is harder to play or run or keep track of all of the rules that are there. And fifth does it, I think better. People still love to go back to that, that older style stuff that they remember. What do you think? Would you go back if they did like a re-release of the three, the third edition rules in a, in a format that makes it nice and concise? Yeah, no, if it was like a collectible kind of thing, like think about it like that, like, like these PDFs are still available. So I can go to drive through RPG and buy all the 3.5 content that I want. Mm -hmm. But um, no, to to have like a really nice kind of not leather bound, but just like a really nice book of of maybe, hey, we we took all the rules. We we changed we fixed them up a little bit so that they're they're more streamlined or something, not streamlined, but like, you know, sorry, what I'm trying to get at is if they could put all of the core material in like two or three books. So I'm Mm -hmm. not buying like dozens of 3.5 books in order to play this game, but like, no. And then you could kind of get a flavor for it. Um, That could be really cool. And, and uh, same with like second edition D and D just like, Hey, we kind of just like fixed a couple things, but it's like D and D classic. Like that could be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if there's a market for it, so to speak, but with the, like, it always cracks me up. Like with the popularity of wow, with fourth edition that was out at the time, Everyone was calling fourth edition like pen, pen and paper World of Warcraft. And why would you want to do that when you can just play World of Warcraft? But clearly there's like a draw there. And mm-hmm. I keep hoping that they make a video game using the fourth edition rule set because mm-hmm. it was so for, like it was kind of like crunchy, like not crunchy, but just like video gamey, I guess. And you selected powers and things like that. Um, not not completely off topic, but this popped into my head uh puffin forest who's a youtube channel 
-hmm. did a great video where he talked about uh, second edition Pathfinder and he bought the second edition Pathfinder book and he's like, okay, before I start this, I just want to give you like, here's a quick history on, on Pathfinder in general. And it was interesting hearing him talk about 3.5. And then when fourth edition came out, Pathfinder really became this like torchbearer to continue the 3.5 tradition. And then when fifth edition came out, he talked a lot about the playtest for fifth edition and how they got rid of all of these plus twos and plus fours and, and minus twos and, and things like that in combat that fourth edition and 3.5 had in favor of advantage and disadvantage. So they got rid of all of that stuff it just in favor of like, if you have this thing, you get advantage. If you don't have this thing, you have dis or you know, you have disadvantage on this thing. And it streamlined the game a whole bunch and made it like that. But the people that enjoyed that crunchiness, and I gotta admit, like I enjoy that. And I think like listening to you play, like we both love fifth edition D&D, but you enjoy that. And so mm -hmm. there's definitely like, I think a market of people that would really enjoy a 3.5 classic because of that. And that yeah. would be really cool. But they would have to release a book and not just the PDFs. Cause I can go buy PDFs for days, but if it was a really nice book that I could own and put on my shelf with mm -hmm. my um, tales from the loop and all of my other RPGs, this my RPG shelf that's over there. But yeah, no, that, that could be really fun. Like a collector's edition or something. Yeah. And we know there's kind of a market for it. Cause you wouldn't have the whole ODD stuff. You wouldn't have, um, I mean, even the other game you played, which is, you know, your favorite BX game or oh, the BX the D &D, yeah. stuff going on, or even all of the different, um, you know, stuff that we get from questing beast and all that. That's a huge community still. And that's still basically like a classic, Dungeons and Dragons, mm -hmm. just those people are hold, like you said, bearing the torch or keeping it going, not yeah. letting it die and sticking with it because they like it. And I think that's kind of cool. The second thing that it made me think of too was just the concept of if we just, without all arguing amongst each other, one is harder to play than the other. Doesn't I'm not saying one's better or, or because of that, but one is a little bit harder because you're doing a lot more, like you said, number crunching. One's a little bit easier because the rules have been streamlined. Take away which one you think is better. I like this idea that people still like to go back to something that's harder to do every now and then because if something's too easy, you don't get the same feeling of accomplishment when you've done something that's harder. So in the context of what we were just talking about in World of Warcraft, uh, I was just telling a buddy of mine, I was, I'm was i out there in this world in this low-level character, and for the first time, I died six times already playing classic WoW, doing normal out-in-the-world adventures, and that's six times more than I died when I restarted regular WoW, where you're a superhero and nothing can kill you no matter how where you're running through the world. And all of a sudden, that made it a little better because the difficulty was raised up. And because you could beat the difficulty and you and you bashed your head against the difficulty, you felt accomplishment at the end of it. So even though I had to go do these stupid quests where there's so many people around and you can't do things, right? And you're trying to wait for them to do stuff. And then you start forming groups with people that are completely random people and you're talking to them because you're waiting for something to pop or you're waiting for something to happen. You're kind of bonding over the difficulty right mm -hmm. the, the thing that's making you wait whereas if you start regular wow now your character's so good you don't have to get a group if you don't need to or if you do get a group you don't have to talk with them because you guys can do something in five minutes and you're gone and there's never waiting for anything and you don't have to get any type of personal connection with them whereas in this other game you did and it's so weird that it's the reason it's happening is because the game was tougher <laughs> mm -hmm. and it was it was onerous and you might even say just looking at it out of the box like why would they make a quest and make it so it's it populates so seldomly that there's hundreds of people standing around waiting for it that just seems like bad game design and in the reality it was creating people um getting into groups it was giving people a feeling of accomplishment if they actually did spend the 45 minutes trying to get the the fifth carrot or whatever they needed to get whatever it was yeah. by the end of it, even though it was frustrating during the whole time. And you're like, why do they do this at the end of it? You felt like you did something. And I wonder if a lot of us that maybe play that, 
those style of games, the harder style of games, the original D and D style of games where you had characters where you were on your fifth and sixth character in the campaign and they were dying left and right. But when one finally makes it, it's that character stand out to you more than your other stable of characters that you've had in the other games you've played. Um, do those games where it was hard and difficult and almost nearly impossible to beat, do those stand out more than the ones you breeze through because you had a really good character and they were a cleric and paladins and you just guys tore everything up and turned everything and smited everything and killed everything. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't too tough, which campaign stands out. So I think there's something there to that. That was just interesting. And it made me rethink about my Dungeons and Dragons games. I think you're talking a lot about why Dungeon Crawl Classics is, exists. Yes. Um, because the way you're describing all of that is really the the fundamental, I don't know, philosophy about when DCC was created. Like, he went back and, and read a lot of those novels that inspired D&D and played original D&D and was like, how can we, like, what was the, the feeling of it? And you did. It was a lot more lethal, which is why the, the OSR movement of old school D&D is around because people liked that feeling and you play a zero level funnel of, of DCC. And that's where you start with four to five zero level peasant characters who have no class, but they can barely hit something with their like pitchforks, or maybe they have like a kitchen knife they're using as a dagger because they're a cook or something like that. But those games, those funnels that I've played have been more memorable than a lot of games because of characters dying. And then mm. you realize that your one character that survived, you're like, he's rolled above a 16 for like seven rolls in a row. And that's amazing. And so yeah. then you're like, it's almost time for him to die. Like, what if I roll my eighth one and it's and it doesn't hit this monster? Or how does this work? And so um, I don't know. It, I like those games and they're not for everybody. We've learned mm. this. If you listen yes. to past shows, we have learned that that is not for everybody um, because people like to feel like heroes. But for me, I really like the the random chance survivability of it. Mm -hmm. And there's something to be said about that because that those characters, you know, my my radish farmer has a I, I really do care about him. And I was so excited when I finished that zero level funnel because my radish farmer was going to like grow up into a wizard or he was going to grow up into a knight or something. And I got to choose that. And I liked that idea that he's like, now that he survived this, this really horrible adventure, he's going to graduate and actually become a full fledged adventurer because of the experience that is, that he had. And there's something about that. Um, but it is punishing and it's unforgiving and it's not for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. but I, but I think they're, you're right. Like maybe, maybe wow, classic, like clearly people are, I mean, I would say millions, maybe, I don't know. Thousands of people are playing wow classic right now and millions really, sure. really enjoying the, the struggle of it. And so mm -hmm. there's an audience for that. And there's probably an audience for, well, there is an audience for that in tabletop RPGs, but I think maybe people need to, to give it an honest try to see mm -hmm. if you enjoy it, you know? So yeah. I don't know, but yeah. No, I feel like you're describing hard. Dungeon Crawl Classics to a T. That's exactly <laughs> yeah. what it is. It's like I was kind of serving it up as a softball. Oh, I knew okay. you were because <laughs> I thought that whole this whole week has been me thinking about that, and that's where I was going with it. Is that that's why that exists? That's why it's popular because there is that group of people that I think like it, like just like you said. And I think it's interesting for those of you that might be say, "Well, I don't really like that game," or "I didn't like that game," or "I I don't like to jump on the game that everybody thinks is fun or popular." And I get that. You know, you do your own thing. But the thing I liked about it from a dungeon master perspective is that when you play an MMO like that, it feeds you up some really cool creative seeds. If you want to do side quests and add them into your own campaigns, mm -hmm. it gives you cool themes because when they create a game like that there and they have to, like you said, service the thousands that are playing or even the millions in the in World of Warcraft's um, aspect there's so many creative people building these quests that most people just click a button and they move on. They don't read the text, but me as a dungeon master, every now and then I pick a certain one and I just follow the chain and I read all the text and I think to myself, Oh, that's really interesting. I like how they did this one thing. I'm going to tweak that. And it now could become some type of side quest that I get to put in one of my campaigns. Mm -hmm. So I can really maneuver some of these things about, because they do think about, 
you know, why is there conflict and how can the player resolve the conflict and what makes sense? Even if their theirs is more like go kill five boars and come back. Well, I could switch it into be something, you know, just go and fix the problem and let the players decide how they're going to fix the problem. But the problem still is cool, intricate reason because two villages are fighting and the farmers are, are trying to sabotage each other. And now I can throw players in the middle of that and see how they handle it. And it could be a really cool thing. So it can be pretty inspirational. And then just the idea, taking this idea that maybe if I made my campaigns a little harder, maybe if I made my campaigns a little more deadlier, are they going to stick in my players' minds more than any of the other campaigns they played? Right? They've played lots of campaigns, and they've had lots of cool characters and, and lots of good dungeon masters. But how is mine going to stick out into their mind when, when they think of those stories to tell? Well, maybe if I make it harder, maybe if I make it more deadly, I make them really, really feel achievement. When they go to tell that Dungeons & Dragons story to their friend, it might be one of the games I ran instead of one of the other games that they other played. So that was the other thing that kind of jumped up in my mind so that here's, was the interesting thing i mean here's what wizards needs to do yes tell they us. need to come out with new <laughs> new coke sorry new D, &D and it's awful <laughs> and nobody likes it and then after like six months of that they bring back D, D classic and everyone loves it and they're just like oh yeah that uh, we we had new D, &D and it was just awful and then we brought back coke class a new D, &D classic and it tastes so good and everybody loves it Mm -hmm. and then you just use that as the the base for the rest of your billion uh, dollar business right there, you there. Go. i'm um, sure of it <laughs> that one's free wizards that one's free yeah. for you <laughs> just give us an invite to your uh event next year that's, oh yeah that's we wanna, we'll go to la that'll be great <laughs> to hang out so that was a bit for news those are the couple things that kind of popped up on my radar um we'll keep you updated as more stuff comes out but i think that kind of leads us into our game plan, which really it sounds like, even though Jordan's kind of hinted at it a couple of times already in the session, in the in the episode, that this week might be our last week of lots of games. While a couple of you know, while Jordan has to deal with um, being an actor, an actor. Although I am playing tomorrow, so uh, I'm starting the Acquisitions Incorporated game tomorrow. But usually, my players we play on like Wednesdays and and Fridays, but we can't because I'm in a play right now. So. Uh, I've got let's rehearsals and then the show starts. What? Yeah, let's, let's talk about that a second. So you're not the dungeon master. You've created a character. Yeah. But tell me, did you guys do a session zero? Did he create any things for you to read? Are you guys talking in a Discord channel? Let's talk about this whole starting of a new campaign thing as you see it from another dungeon master. We've got, yeah. So we, well, tomorrow is literally going to be our new our session zero um, or okay. it might be a session one. I'm not really sure. We have our characters created um, mm -hmm. and first level, first level, level one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, in the character. And so we have a Google Hangouts that we all chat in. So no discord, ah. but we have a Google Hangouts chat. Um, and so uh, the dungeon master said that uh, we're going to start in water deep and we're, and basically like, we have to accept this uh, plot hook. Premise. Yeah, yes. this premise is that we're in Waterdeep. We can do whatever we want in Waterdeep, but eventually we need to, we're going to uh, go and become uh, interns at Acquisitions Incorporated. So we're going to, we're going to, in Waterdeep, we go to the Acquisitions Incorporated home base. We uh, apply for internships. And so I think levels one, maybe level two is actually us going through the internship process of like, mm -hmm. well, are you good enough to be an intern? Like, are you going to survive the rigmarole? I don't know. I haven't read the adventure, but that's kind of what I'm assuming because it seems like something Jerry would write. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's been kind of uh, open, like, and well, I shouldn't say open. It's been kind of like, I don't really know what to expect other than we're in Waterdeep. And he gave us kind of like an open uh, Waterdeep to explore. So I'm wondering if like the first half of our session is going to be like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm using my money to buy spell components and things like that. Um, maybe I'll meet a couple of key NPCs that will, will come later, but eventually we're all going to go there. Or he said, do you want to skip all of that and just go straight to starting the adventure? Um, I'm kind of leaning more on if there's content to exploring Waterdeep, let us explore Waterdeep. But if there's not, like if, if we do need to just dive into the adventure to like get along with or to go forward, then we can dive into the adventure. So I, yeah, and I am playing a 
sorcerer with the now i am got to look it up the dragon <laughs> what is the dragon sorcerer is called they're just like dragonkin or i swear no, they're I, like um... i made this character guys i know what i'm talking about draconic bloodline that's the word i was looking bloodline. for bloodline that was the word i couldn't yeah. remember so I'm a level one human sorcerer, draconic bloodline. I've taken uh, the variant human, so I have the feat of elemental adept. So my fire spells can't be um, resisted, Resist. which is yeah. really nice. And I'm gonna kind of focus on fire spells. And then my background is, uh, I'm looking at my character right now. Background is celebrity adventure scion. So I am, I have a celebrity dad, like, and my dad is uh, this golden dragon that would polymorph himself into a human and go on adventures and and get money and, and do all this kind of stuff, save princesses from castles, do whatever he wants, but he was a golden dragon. And so I mm -hmm. like that idea. And so I'm trying to live in my father's shadow is kind mm -hmm. of the direction I'm going with the character. Um, and in order to make a name for myself, I'm going to join Acquisitions Incorporated, and hopefully that adventuring company will allow me to, you know, climb up the ranks and actually become an important member in the adventuring world of some mm -hmm. sort. So uh, that's that, that I like that a lot. And so part of my background is I have the feature of name dropping. So if I'm in a certain place, I can be like, oh, perhaps you've heard of my father, and then I might mm -hmm. be able to get things for free or, or more information or something like that um right. and and i have like all of my charisma skills uh to go along with my being a, a charismatic um sorcerer in general so i've got you know deception and performance and persuasion and things like that should be should be really fun i'm excited for it i don't know anything about the adventure um i read the entire acquisitions book except for the adventure because i knew i was going to play in it but there's mm -hmm. lots of fun mechanics and stuff so and he is running the adventure from that yeah yeah so gotcha. that is yeah we're not playing an acquisitions incorporated game we're literally playing the adventure in the book which is gotcha. an acquisitions incorporated game but he's not writing it himself um, but from what he tells me is that the book's really good at being like here's the joke and here's how you set up the joke so that it's funny and so it should just be a really awesome comical time like i'm i'm super looking forward to playing in this um, because yeah. i i mean i got into D, &D a lot a large part of me getting into D, D was acquisitions incorporated those old fourth edition podcasts that they had um and so i love the world and i love the humor and it's gonna be i think it'll be a lot of fun so yeah. so of all of that if you were going to be running this game or you're going to be running a campaign set in this, mm -hmm. what are the differences for the way you're setting it up? Not good or bad, just Jordan, the DM is setting this up. What are the things you're doing with your players? What are you setting up pre, are you doing a session zero or are you diving right in? Are you starting with a, are you asking your players to start with a conceit? Like, Hey, we're just all going to agree to this so we can move on or what are you thinking? What, what's well, your process there? I'll, I'll reflect back to ghost marsh or salts. Yeah. Uh, ghosts of salt marsh. Ghosts of salt marsh. I said <laughs> ghost marsh. That was weird. And I couldn't think of the right thing in my brain. Yeah. Ghosts of salt marsh. Um, even going back even further. So hot springs Island, my players came to the table and I told them, this is what happened to you. And now you're on this Island. And so mm -hmm. I gave them their backstory. I gave, and which a lot of them I think were kind of off-putting about because they were they were very much like, hey, you know, I came up with this character concept, and here's my background, and here's all this other fun stuff. But at the same time, they, I needed them on the island, and in order to get them to the island, I said we're gonna wash away all of that, and you guys basically got into a bad contract with a company, and now you're paying off a debt. And that's why you're here. And they literally dropped you off on this island. It's an unexplored island. Your job is to go find money, bring it back to the Martell company, and then eventually you'll pay off your, your debt and then you'll be free. And it was a, they were like, well, how much is your debt? And I'm like, you don't know. Like, I mean, you do know, but you, but we're going to make it an, an indeterminable amount of money so that we can basically keep playing until we kind of reach the end of the con logical conclusion of the adventure. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that how well received that was. They were they were like 
shrugged their shoulders and said, okay, and we had a great time with Hot Springs Island. Now for Ghosts of Salt Marsh, I only said, you guys need to be in, we didn't have a session zero, but we did talk about it in Google Hangouts. And I said, whatever backgrounds you guys want to have, that's fine. But you need to either be living in Salt Marsh or coming to Salt Marsh for a specific reason. And then from there, we'll, we'll extrapolate like what you want to do. So we had one guy who worked on a pirate ship and then he docked and kind of stayed in Salt Marsh. We had a dwarf come for um, the dwarves are like mining in Salt Marsh. And he came down to work in the mines, but ended up starting a bar. Um, the artificer is there because of magical secrets that he heard in the area. So there was enough of like, I could sprinkle enough plot hooks for them. And so they each kind of had a different one, but then coming to and and meeting was, was their choice. And, and, mm -hmm. and I'm like, do you guys want to meet in a tavern? Where do you want to go? But like you, we need to have you guys meet up somehow and you need to be that. And so they did that and became an adventuring party. And now, now they have their own adventures that they're working together with. Um, traditionally, if I'm, if I'm running a homebrew game that I'm going to do myself, uh, write myself is what I'm hinting at. Then I will do a session zero because I want everybody to know everybody else's background. And I want to take that background and work it into the story somehow. Mm -hmm. Um, but if I'm running a pre-made adventure, it, it's almost easier to just dive into the the campaign so to speak um, right cool because i'm a lazy dm and and i could be like no i want to take your background and rewrite this adventure so that it works in there but like it's just easier to run the adventure sometimes so that was long-winded i feel but did i answer your question yeah no that was the thing i just it n no way is the right way it was just it's always good to see how different ways are and how those of us that do run games we kind of express our process i've done the same thing I've, I've really leaned into a lot of session zeros but then if i'm going to do a one shot that might be one of those things where i tell the players right away hey here's the premise everybody buys into this premise yeah. right if you want to play because we're going to do this thing and it will only make sense if we buy into it if you're not buying into it don't sign up for this one shot but in campaign um i've jumped around with telling them how it's going to start versus let's put them all over and then I'm going to use adventure to bring them together. They don't know how they're going to get together. They don't know each other yet and how that, um, and like the, the most recent campaign that I'm kind of putting together to play, I wanted to do this idea that the players don't know each other. The characters don't know each other, but I need to bring them together for some reason. And here's those reasons and play those reasons out. And I've been leaning towards, I want to do session zeros for each individual player. Mm. that gets them to where we need to be. And then we go on and do that. And that I think is kind of how critical role did a little bit of their most recent one. I don't know how the first one started out, but their most recent one, there seemed to be off screen sessions that they had to start those things out because they came into when they started the big campaign, the second big campaign over, they had already had some time with Matt doing something. So they already had, and they were level two. They started at level two, I think. So yeah, yeah. it was, it was, so it was kind of a cool thing. Yeah. yeah. And so I've been playing, not because of that, but just uh, uh, as coming up with the idea the same way of, Oh, it'd be kind of cool to see it. Let's bring them together more organically versus, Hey, let's just say you're together. But with an Ack Inc game, I want people who are going to play in that, that want to start a franchise. So to me, that says like in my notes to anybody that's like, all right, I'm going to run a Ack Inc game. Who wants to start an Ack Inc franchise? Don't sign up to this game if you're not into that. Yeah. <laughs> and setting the tone, like you said, of this is going to be a fun, comical, jokey kind of game mm -hmm. with lots of crazy pop culture references that seem to pop up in the Dungeons & Dragons world. If you want to play in that game, sign up for this campaign. Because if you don't want that, if you want serious hardcore dark fantasy that's not this campaign so i've been trying to get do a, a better job of explaining the tone mm -hmm. what we want to do so that the right players join up for it and, and you don't get in you know the, the player that doesn't want to play that style of game yeah because you've had that conversation you've had the conversation with the person that said i don't want to play that game I want to play this other game. This sounds more fun to me. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, okay. like Ravenloft is very different from yeah. Hot Springs Island. Like the two of yeah. them just have a different, completely different mindset to, to jump in and play. 
Um, so if you are expecting an Acquisitions Incorporated game um, in the humor and, and things like that, but you're you're put into, uh, I don't know, some World of Darkness vampire, the Masquerade game, then you're just like, well, this is not what I was expecting at all. So I agree. Awesome. Well, keep going. I mean, you got a couple more things in there. Um, so that's coming up. That's your Ack Inc. You're playing first level character. Sounds cool. Sorcerer. So you're a gold dragon bloodline because you got to choose your bloodline. Right? Yeah, you had to choose basic. I want fire would be gold or red. And I gotcha. wanted my, my dad to be a good dragon, a metallic dragon. So I went with the gold dragon. Um, cool. So, yeah. Should be lots of fun. So what about the games you ran dungeon mastered wise? Yeah. Um, so like I hinted at Ghost of Saltmarsh, uh, we hit the high seas. So they have been hired by yet another NPC in the town to uh, salvage a, a sinking ship that was discovered drifting in the ocean. And so they found this ship. Um, uh, but getting there had a bunch of random encounters that I ended up rolling for. And that was our whole session was just fights on the deck of the ship because uh, we had these random encounters and... Um, it ended up taking the entire session because I they rolled poorly, so there was lots of those. Um, I ended up using a creature codex monster called the Gorgoctopus, which was really fun, and he could like pick up NPC or pick up the players and then huck them across the boat, which was really fun for like the the dwarf who has a twenty five movement speed. I could throw him across the boat, and then he would have to like run back to the octopus, and so um, it added uh, fun mechanics. I liked that a lot, and then they fought some evil. Sahagwin, um, yeah. who uh, kind of stormed the boat. And this was something that I did that was interesting because there are 30 dwarves on this boat as also with our party of, of five characters, four characters. And they were like, well, where are the dwarves? And I'm like, well, imagine that there are actually like uh, 30 Sahagwin that are coming up on the boat. You guys are dealing with six of them and their boss. But, like, the dwarves are fighting off as many as they can as well. And they were like, oh, okay. And then it didn't clutter the battlefield, but it also kind of hinted that there could be reinforcements if the dwarves were losing. And I wanted to ask you, like, how did you think about that? Should I, should I have actually put out a bunch of NPC tokens and said, no, these guys are fighting on all these fronts? Or do you just kind of hand wave it and say, yes, they're fighting the Sahagwin, but you guys are focused on this fight on the deck kind of a thing? It's, it's a, I see the advantages of doing both, but one of them is, I, again, I'm a lazy dungeon master. So it's like, no, if I could just hand wave this and have you guys focused on the six monsters that I put on the boat, that seems a lot easier than trying to have, you know, but we did have reinforcements. So I, I rolled kind of secretly for the dwarves and I'm like, nope, we're going to have a couple more Sahagwin climb up the side of the boat because they got they got past the dwarves. So now, even though you, you whittled it down to, to two Sahagwin, there's two more that jump on the boat. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I, uh, I have been playing them out. I have been putting, because I use roll 20, it's yeah. not so hard to throw out a bunch of tokens. And that's different if you're playing at a table. Um, it's different if you're doing theater of the mind and trying to keep track of all that craziness where you can kind of streamline that. Um, and I think all ways are, like I've said, good. I tend to lean towards tactical with my players because my players love to maneuver and outmaneuver stuff. Mm -hmm. So throwing, like I can think of when we were doing um, Storm King's Thunder, we had the Battle of Tribor was a big battle and you had lots of orcs, you had lots of uh, magmen, you had giants all on the board, all on an enormous map. And players were everywhere and doing all kinds of things. We also did um, the Battle of Nightstone, which was there's a bunch of goblins and well, I don't maybe I don't want to spoil it too much, but there's stuff happening inside. the The players react to it. Then something happens, and they have to react to something that's happened on the outside. So then they do that stuff, and then reinforcements come, and they're having to deal with that. And all of that, I was placing out all these huge numbers of tokens to represent all these big numbers of things going on. Um, so I think I do that for the most part, but it slows the game down. So as a dungeon master and for a dungeon master who knows their players, you got to know if your players, A, are going to like that kind of thing. Yeah. My players do. My players love figuring out the right ranges to stuff, how to maneuver, how to get to cover, to do something, to move around things. They love all those things. So it works for my table, but it probably wouldn't have worked for like if I'm running a convention game or if I'm running a theater of the mind game, I'm going to do like what you did. I'm going to say, hey, 
there's this big swirling battle going on. Here's the thing you need to focus on because this is the thing yeah. trying to hit you, even though there's lots of other stuff going on. And just kind of explain that away in the in the the general description of the battle, uh, of, you know what's happening. So probably just depends on what group I have, yeah. what player. That makes sense. Um, yeah, and then I'm slowly prepping my Shadowfell game. I'm using the fourth edition supplement Shadowfell, Gloomrot, and Beyond, which is about the big city Gloomrot that exists in the Shadowfell. And my players are currently trying, and it, the book also has a bunch of like outliers, like this is what's going on outside of Gloomrot, just in the Shadowfell in general. And so my players are, are they, they found um, a, a hotel, so to speak, called House of the Black Lanterns. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of living there. They paid some money for some rooms. They've been doing some favors to kind of stay longer. And they're trying to figure out, like, well, where do we go from here? So I need to plot out my Shadowfell game, which I'll, I'll say this now. I want to do this online. I want to start um, doing my dungeon prep, uh, my game prep uh, streaming. So I think I have Monday off I, and I have to get the game prepped. So this Monday I might stream my uh game prep for ghosts of salt marsh and for my shadowfell game so if you're interested in that watch my youtube channel and and i'm sure i'll have like a, a video up um saying that i'm gonna go live in a couple hours or something like that but mm -hmm. um yeah so uh i'm figuring that out but it's really fun and i was very hesitant because i've been running so many pre-written pre-written adventures lately that I was a little like nervous getting back into Jordan kind of writing his own stuff. But this, uh, this campaign setting has given me so much information to be like, Oh, they could go here. They could go here. They go here. It's just a big sandbox. So now I have to weave that thread for them to, to go through. And I'm changing a couple things here to make it more forgotten realmsy as opposed to, uh, the nether veil, I think is what it is. So the, like the God Paylor is, is big in the setting and things like that. And I'm going to change that to Lathander and some other stuff, but that cool. should be a lot of fun. Yeah. And then finally, uh, I'll just take up all the time, I guess, if that's okay. <laughs> finally, I've, we finished our BX D and D game, which mm -hmm. was a lot of fun, but it's so, it's, and I guess going back to our original conversation of like, do you feel, do you remember these things if you, if you barely survive, but BX D and D is very much like you do, you hit less often, but monsters also have fewer hit points. So it, the way Lex described it, I thought was really good, is that you are, you can't hit the monster, but when you do hit the monster, you end up killing him or decapitating or doing a bunch of stuff like that. So we ended up fighting like a, a mummy scorpion guy at the very end of this. And none of us could hit him. I ended up, like, we're, we're trying really hard. The the thief ended up getting a really good sneak attack on him. And then I think finally, um, either our cleric uh, did a sling attack or something. And David and, and Goliath knocked him down. Um, but that is a system where I don't like how brutal it is. Because I want to hit the monster. Like when I hit the monster, I feel like I've accomplished something and it's really frustrating when I can't hit the monster. Mm -hmm. uh, and th what I've learned from playing BXD and D is that there are things that have evolved in the game that are definitely for the better, like ascending armor class. I enjoy that a whole bunch more. Um, everybody rolling initiative and then finding out where you are in your initiative order. I definitely like that more. In BX D and D, every round you roll a D6. If your D6 is higher than the enemy's D6, then you go first. Vice versa, the enemy will go first. If it's tied, everything happens at the same time. Um, and there's just a lot of like, okay, who's rolling initiative this round? Who's rolling initiative this round? And I'm like, no, I wish we could just streamline this. Like there was, there was just a, a better way of doing it and back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, and little things that I think we take for granted. So maybe go read some BX d and It's free. The rules are free. You can find them online. And then learn that you could be like, I really appreciate that we have where 5th edition is at right now because I know I do. Like I, we had a lot of fun in that game. I really loved my character, but mechanically um I like how D&D has evolved. And so yeah. it's kind of going back to saying like, well, like what if they released a BX D&D classic version? I don't mm -hmm. personally I don't think I would buy that. 3.5 <laughs> probably. AD&D maybe, mm -hmm. but like original BX D&D, I'm I don't know. Yeah. If I would do that or not.
but yeah i love where the rules are now don't get me wrong by any means and i like going back and, and playing a taking a nostalgic trip but i really think we're playing the best version of, of dungeons and dragons at the moment fifth edition has just been so good it's been really good i still need to run a fourth edition game for you we talked about that because you love the tactical combat and i think that could be a that could be a lot of fun so yeah that'd be great that would be maybe we should yeah we should do that and put it on the saturday morning D &D show channel just a one shot or something so you can figure it out it's been a long time since i've run fourth edition but uh i can i can remember i'll do my best (laughs) cool cool well, we got five I minutes left. Yeah. Do you want to talk about some games for five minutes? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I ran mine. Um, Seeking Revenors on Monday nights. Uh, we had a, instead of having one of the players run a, uh, one player couldn't make it. So we didn't want to scratch the session. The players still wanted to play. And usually when that happens, we, all of us as dungeon masters have to make the decision of, well, now what do we do? We're not going to have a player that's going to be there. And so sometimes we might run the characters ourselves. Sometimes we might ask one of the players at the tables to run it. Um, Or maybe some of you have even said, well, that player just won't be there. When they come back, we'll just throw them back in. And we don't, we won't even care how or why that, that makes sense. Um, What I did this time around, which was really fun is I brought in a guest player, similar to the time we brought in Jordan to play as a guest player. That was fun. Um, But this time we had that guest player play as one, the character that was going to be gone. So Rock the Barbarian, the, the yeah. uh, work Barbarian. And what was really funny is those two are friends anyways in real life. So it was fun for the one player to play or the one person to play that character and try to be Rock, you know, and, and do the things. And I think it was really fun for them to jump in and play that character. And then I didn't have to worry about it. So that was really nice. Um, they're, they're in a huge fight. They're doing a lot of dungeon delving in the Black Pyramid. This is a a module that's a Gary Gygax module that I converted to work in fifth edition. And uh, eventually once they're out of it and they're done, I'll I'll actually say the name of it so people can go look at and see how close it is that I kept it or how different I changed things. Mm -hmm. Um, The one thing that popped up in there that I was really fun is this idea of changing one minor thing that the players think they know. (laughs) So this was an example of they had to fight some trolls and the players all know about fighting trolls and they know that they're, they're doing all this damage and the troll is regenerating up. And even if they're only remembering different versions of the troll, they know it regenerates and they're, they're using their, their player knowledge to say, you know what, we need to burn this thing so that the regeneration doesn't work. And then that's how we're going to kill it. And uh, they even bring it up the rule like uh, in it. And what I did is I added to one of the trolls a little ring of regeneration. That's not the typical one that you get in fifth edition, but it's very different. That just does a very small amount. It was specifically given to this troll to enhance how tough the troll could be because the ring could make sure that even if it took fire damage or even if it took whatever, it still regenerated and then it had hit points and it could still could do things each round. They had to figure out that there was a ring. So we go round after round. These guys are beating on it, burning it, trying to do whatever they want. And it keeps getting up and rising like a zombie, like making that roll for the, the fifth edition version of the zombies. Like you keep making that saving mm-hmm. throw. They, they rise back up and start fighting again. And the, the looks on their faces and they're like, the idea that they're like, they kept asking me, are you sure? Like, cause they know, yeah. the rule, right. They're just like, what's going on. So it's finally about the third or fourth time they've dropped this thing and it gets back up and fights. One of them finally says, wait a minute, something's going on. I want to do a perception check. And I'm like, aha, there you are. You see the toe ring shining off. He rolls really good. And there's a toe ring on this thing. So then they finally cut it off. They take the ring away. It doesn't regenerate. And they figure out what has been going on, what has fooled them. And the cool thing about that is just by changing one little thing that they think they know about is really good Dungeon Master tip. One, because they'll remember it. Two, sometimes you want to play with their um, their knowledge. But the third reason I think that's the best reason of all is it keeps them on their toes and it doesn't always let them assume they know what's going on. And as a dungeon master, when things are happening, you don't want to tell them specifically why something's happening. And you can see them start to get frustrated when like, no, this is, 
this is supposed to kill that thing. Why is it not killing that thing? There's a reason. There's a real reason, and it'll happen, and, it'll, and you'll see. But my troll was a little bit different than your troll. And coming up a little bit later in this um, adventure, most of them don't watch this show, um, so I'll, I'll say it, or at least maybe they had they didn't stay till the very end here at one o'clock. But there's a giant troll that Gary Gygax introduced, and he puts a stat block in the thing because it wasn't something that showed up in the in the monster menu. So it's again this idea of yeah, you see another troll, but this one's different, and it has some different things to it, and some different things are going to happen. So even though their player knowledge will be challenged again, what I liked about that is challenging their knowledge. Make your goblins different make your kobolds slightly different, make your orcs different, make, you know, change little things up to keep them on the toes in your world is my advice on that one. Other than that, we played Tomb of Annihilation on Wednesday night, which is really good. We're in the Tomb of Annihilation. We're practically nearly getting annihilated in every room we go in and, and slowly surviving. Um, it's been really fun. The Dungeon Master's done a great job on it. I definitely recommend you all go check it out. I don't want to do too many spoilers on them, and nothing really came up rule-wise that was too interesting. It was pretty much a typical check these couple rooms out and try to figure out what's going on um, type thing. We did have to fight a Shadow Demon. If you haven't added a Shadow Demon against your players at some time, throw one of them, especially if you're in the Shadow Fell. A cool Shadow Demon attack on your players would be really fun. Yeah. Check that out. So... But those games are good. I have a Monday night. Well, we're going to have a holiday game this Monday because it's a holiday for us in the U.S. And our players can be playing. We might play extra long. So you might keep an eye out on Twitter um, because we might be having an extra long session that you can come and watch us play on Monday night. And we will have our Wednesday night game ready to go. And we're still working on stuff that's coming up. I know some people in chat asked about, are you guys going to play a Descent into Avernus campaign? There's some stuff in the works. There's some stuff that people have been asking us about. There's, or even me, even specifically too, but once we have the, the details of that, we'll, we'll start announcing it. But nothing to announce quite yet. So, but I well, think that's, that's awesome. it. That's great. Awesome. Uh, cool. That was, uh, the, so when we started the show today, we were like, what are we going to talk about? There's not a lot of news. I don't know. And we ended up having a great discussion. So um, good job, Mr. Lucian. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming out and watching us live. Thank you for listening to the podcast, for subscribing on YouTube. We're still trying to get to a thousand subscribers. We've gotten a lot in the last couple weeks. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, share with your friends, all that jazz. Um, and we might have a giveaway to try and get more subscribers here shortly. I got to talk with Lucian after the show and we yeah. have to figure out what we can give away, but stay tuned for that. Um, thank you again for uh, everything. You guys are awesome. We love our audience. Um, and we will see you next week with another episode of the Saturday Morning D&D &D Show. Uh, goodbye, everybody. Bye.